welcome to World Rowing's Coastal Race Module Keynote Series. In this session, we're going to be covering racing turns. My name's Gwyn Batten, I'm a former Olympic medalist and former World Rowing Coastal Champion. So, let's get going. In this video, we're going to be looking at racing turns. Two types of turns from the beach sprint and just some examples of, of turning in the endurance format. So let's start off with the 180 turn in beach sprint. And you can see I've developed a diagram here for you with three phases. This A phase, which is that entry into that turn. The B phase, where the main momentum of turning around the buoy. And then the C phase, which have turned the exit. So if we look, I want you to look really closely as I go through the examples of these, but the slingshot, you know, using the momentum of the boat and the turning um, drag of the, of the shafted oar on the inside to get uh, quite a great amount of turning in that first phase through here. So turning that very much a slingshot and the shafting of the oar. And then really, as we attempt, the boat speed has dropped by now and we haven't got the advantage of the slingshot. And we're very much turning the boat using the outside oar as you come around, especially in that first half of the stroke. You've got the greatest turning momentum in there. OK, and then what you'll find is as they come around on that inside, the controlling of the break of that shaft will give them the ideal turn that will get them to, in a situation where as they're coming out of the turn and the exit, they bring the boat back up to, to speed and make any last minute final steering instructions. That last, that bit between this big turning buoy and the first slalom marker is actually one of the most difficult um, sections to race um, for a number of reasons, physical as well as, as technical. So let's have a little look at an example. Got a great example here from Shenzhen, got a solo from Hong Kong. So let's have a little look how this goes. Approaching in, shafting the inside or good long follow three strokes all the way around as it comes out of that turn, just making some last minute adjustments. We've got an aerial view here. Again, some crews coming round. So the shafting of the inside or and the paddling round. It's a very, very physical process, that turn. We've got another bit of video here for us to watch. This video game from Shenzhen, Sculler Solo from Great Britain, racing the Sculler from Ireland. I want you to look at the GB Sculler as he comes in and that shafting and slingshot. So again, come in, you can see clearly shafts that all round um, and is able to bring, probably using three quarters of his slide there, and then straight out. Okay. Not quite as quick here from the Irish Sculler, really not being able to shaft as, as effectively. He hasn't turned his oar over. He's kept his, his oar in the conventional position, so not reversed it. Okay, so if we look, I've got some stills here, really nice stills here from rounding the top boy. So in A, so this shot at A, um, it's inside or it's shafted, so you could see the cavitation or the waves coming back off the top of it. Um, and his boat speed is coming quite fast and it's dropping um, as he slows it using the inside oar. Now what's really, a, this slot picture here, B, is the catch of the second stroke. So again, you can see he's just taking that second stroke, clearly buried that oar. You can see his um, hands on his chest. He's got lots of space to be able to, to take that stroke. Okay, um, This one here is taken at the end of the third stroke. And what's perhaps not as great on this one here, but there's a lot of powers going around because you can see the amount of um, wash coming off the stern here. Um, if, if he turned his oar over, he would be able to tilt the inside rail down. I'll show you some more pictures um, in the next slide to illustrate that. But you can see here, by the time he's done his sixth stroke, he's back and starting the acceleration phase on the return back to the beach. Now, what's quite interesting, six stroke turn, which I think is an excellent number of strokes, two of which give him the first 90 degrees of the turn because of the slingshot 
and then 4 giving the second lot of 90 degrees. I've got a still here which illustrates my point around the tilting of the rail. So if we look here, at, this is the GBR women's solo. Um, she's maximised the slingshot and she's tilted the inside rail down. You can see that inside rail has come down. Um, and I fundamentally believe that the intensity of the turn, the efficiency of the outside oars to turn the boat round is enhanced through that process. We can see here, um, we've got the sculler here on the top, not using the shafting, um, very much like the Irish sculler that we'd seen in a previous example. And when she comes to the point where she'll start to row on on the outside, um, she'll find that the um, by turning like that, it will actually push the rail out um, and be less efficient. So it's definitely one to, to watch as you're coaching your athletes. So pretty much, let's look at the double now. So we've got the same three phases. We've got the approaching slingshot, we've got the, the, the turn and then the exit. Um, now what you find here is the boat is traveling faster. You've got four oars rather than two, and they're two different individuals. So you've got more options available to you. And again, what you might find is, is that greatest turning um, impact because of the fin, um, is, is in different seats. So let's have a little look at how some of the um, boats are doing this. I'm not going to show you any videos of the double, but I've got a still here taken from the drone um, at 90 degrees through the turn. You can see here the mixed Italian double um, have done quite an interesting approach. So what they've done is the stroke, the stroke here is doing the slingshot at this stage. 90 degrees through, they are maintaining the slingshot bow is no longer taking the pressure of that slingshot but what she's doing is she's able to reach round further okay so um and both of them are rowing on but the bow rower here is able to get a better angle um, by not being not partaking in the slingshot which closes your body up um, as you hold on to the power as you go through so let's let's focus a little bit more on the on the quad OK, so I've got the diagrams here of the slingshot entry, the turn and the exit. So, but remember, we've got eight oars now, four individuals, eight oars, and we also have the um, cocks. Now, the cocks, they have, of course, a great rudder in these boats. And so a lot of the pressure can be taken by the um, by the coxswain through here. So let's have a little look. I've got some examples for us to look at here. Um, so just before we do, let's look at this still. So this is a snapshot at 45 degrees. So that means the return back to the beach is at the bottom of the screen here. Sorry for the orientation here. But if we look closely, so this is at the towards the end of the slingshot. So the boat's now coming to become much more s slowed down um, and a greater effect of the turning. You can see stern three are shafting their inside oars, okay? Whereas bow three are rowing on. And you can see what I love here about this shot here is that the rower are totally in the bow here. Look at how far that reach is coming round to get that great turning momentum. You'll find that the coxswain has um, pulled up the fin and the rudder is hard over. And you could see the amount of white water coming off both boats here. As, as they go through. And it's worth in noticing that because um, the stroke person in this boat is not actually rowing the boat on, so they're trying to maximise that square up on the inside break of the slingshot. So on the left, we've got China. On the right, we've got Spain. So you can see the Chinese have turned really tight in on that boy turn. Um, a little bit of shafting on the left, whereas the Spanish have shafting very, very hard and paddling on and actually haven't actually even taken the boat all the way through 100. They've gone around to about 110 degrees before they've started to row full length, full crew. So a really nice example of how you can make up time through that turn. So if you look now, rather than having clear water, the Spanish were able to make at least half a length on the accuracy of their turn. So here's a still um, through 90 degrees of the of a, 
of the Chinese crew in Shenzhen. Now remember this is a mixed crew here. So what you've got here is the great, you can see they've tilted the inside rail. So they've got really nice efficiency on their outside, really good heights there. They're pulling, all, all four of the crew are pulling around on that. The coxswain's got weight on that inside rail. You can see here bow and um, two have got their wrists dropped and their blades against their chest. So they've gone for the reverse square, which has allowed a greater commensal control. You can see here three. What he's done is he's pushed his wrist up over the top. So he's gone for the conventional square, which is nowhere near as, um, as efficient. Um, so really interesting that even within one boat, there's different techniques. Um, and, you know, if I was coaching these guys, I'd probably look and look at two's technique, demonstrating a really nice position there with the turn on one side and the shafting on the other. You can see the asymmetric power across the body of that row is going to be quite big in that situation. So let's have another little look at turn here. We've got Great Britain on the near side and we have Canada on the far side. So let's have a look. You can see here, Canada clearly um, got a boat length on the Brits as they're coming into this turn. You can see a few bits of swell coming in as the boats are pushing, being pushed up and down um, in the waves. There we go. And you can see it's not affecting their rowing at all. They're used to this. OK, coming into the turn, both crews come into the turn. You can see the British boat very much dependent on stroke person taking that shafting. Whereas the bow three are bringing that boat round. As soon as the shaft is um, released, you can see the Brits come back up to four, all rowing. So really great. And you can see they come out of that turn ahead. So fantastic example of, of making up speed in that turn. And start, let's look at the slalom. And for slalom, it's very, very much about accurate boat placement. And... With the slalom, there's really two different methods here. Um, there's the method where you are clear of the boy, of the slalom boy, so the cigar boy, so that it's not going to be anywhere near your boat. Or there's an option where you want to place that, sla that slalom boy very close to the hull, so it goes down under the rigger. What you really want to avoid is example up here in this top picture here, where um, it hits... Um, towards the end of the oar. You're either going to catch a crab or a bit of a stumble in a row. You could lose a couple of feet and at worst you could actually break your oar. So certainly don't want that option. But you could see here nice still of the Dutch crew mixed um, double here. You could see they've got the cigar boy running underneath their gates. So really great example of great example of accuracy for them and you remember at this stage they're up at 42 strokes per minute so they're not sort of hanging around as they do this so let's have a little look at the other option and this is the option where you want to avoid the slalom boy at all costs and I think there's a really nice example here from from Canada so coming in Bauman and the Canadian boat very much looking round Stroke person just keeping that rhythm running underneath. And if you could see how accurate and close to that boy these guys go, but without hitting it. So I think really good placement. You know, and have just a look at the waves bashing them around as they do that. I've got another example here of Spanish double coming down. And again, they've done their power turn. So they're at one of the hardest sections. Um, as they come onto this and again just really great placement exactly where they want to be reduce the reducing the line just making it as smooth as possible so guys here just hitting it a little bit wide because sort of their option really was to get it a little bit closer to the boat would have been preference for the, these guys i want to show you the probably the best um, clip that i've managed to find of using the technique where you bring it in under the rigger so you can see in this still that I've taken from the video, sorry, it's not a, a really um, good in focus, but you can see Bao is really making looking around, you know, making those small adjustments so that they are placed exactly where they're meant to be. Stroke setting a really good rhythm. And you can see here um, what they've been able to do is get that that boy running down the side of the boat. And so it just gets pushed flat 
by the riggers. OK, so let's look at the video now. A couple of shots of them approaching here. So you see straight down, boat gets pushed down by the riggers and they're on. It's not a break in their technique at all. See the same shot again, but from the stern, just runs down, slides underneath and then straight onto it. We get another view of this. Here we go at full speed, straight under and they're off. You get an aerial shot, how great that placement is. Great. OK, so that's it for the slalom slalom placement. Really, you've got those two options, the one where you stay clear of it or the one where you use your rigger to push the push the slalom down. Now, remember, the boats in the videos that I've shown us have got bow riggers. Um, you may want to be a little bit look at it a little bit differently if you've got stern riggers on your boat. So let's look now at the endurance format. And of course, the critical bit for the endurance format is that you have the whole of the fleet are racing around the same boys. You've got multiple boys and those boys are placed in tactical positions that require you as the crew to be able to make good navigation and good decisions as you approach and turn those boys. There's a lot less control um, in the endurance turning than there is in beach sprint, um, which makes it more fun, to be honest, and a lot more tactics where um, thumb crews can really end up losing a lot of ground by tactical mistakes as they come around the boys. OK, so let's give you an example here. Um, let's give you an example. And I often see this, um, especially at the first boy turn where there's a long run in to the boys. Now, in this example, in this graphic here, we've got the wind and the tide coming from the left. OK, from the left of the screen here. OK, you can see here's the turn. We've got three boats, three different boats approaching. Crew A, crew A, as they come to this boy, they're taking a wide turn. OK, um, and to do that wide turn, they have created themselves in quite a dominant position. OK fundamentally believe that they have the most options and the smallest risk of time penalties if as they're approaching with these three boats um, drawing level with each other. What you've got with um, boat B, boat B has taken the most direct line, the fastest line in essence, um, but what you'll find by taking that fast line and by not going for the outside, they've got a boat on either side of them. So actually they are at the mercy, in essence, of the um, brilliance or the lack of brilliance of the crews on either side of them. And then what we have is we've got crew C here and crew C has, in essence, has misjudged this. And I see this so many times where they've actually misjudged the um, to counter the impact of the wind and tide. And which means that they have come sh up short of the boy, which means they're going to have to do a bigger turn to get themselves round. And in doing that, they are going to slow down. And in doing that, they're going to put themselves broadside on to the crews that are coming behind B um, into this process. So there's a real risk for them um, in terms of collision or penalty from both A and B. The position I would want to approach this, especially if there was a strong wind and strong tide coming in, as there have been in a couple of world championships, I would want to be in A. I've got lots of options if I'm A. B would be the fastest, um, but I'm, my options have been narrowed by crews on either side of me. And I certainly wouldn't want to be crew C, who's misjudged the impact of the wind and waves and tide on their line into the buoy. So I'll give you an example here of a crew that, again, um, has chosen to go outside of the boy line. So they've come from, they've gone for the wide turn rather than the narrow turn. Here's an example where the crews in front of them have gone for the perfect turn, as in close to the boy, but have had a collision um, and the impact that has on that race. And you can see as they come round that turn, crew one and two clash with each other. Three is able to make themselves clear because they just managed to get through and avoid that clash. But what you're really able to see is crew four, the 
because they've got that option and that space to move into rows round the, the clash and actually comes out of the turn um, in the lead. So a really, really great example of, um, of giving yourself space as you approach a turn. There's an example here from, from Hong Kong, from the men's double skull. Um, and again, in, in Hong Kong, this is the second boy in a chicane. So they turn one way and then they turn the other. Um, and so a lot of, sometimes you're on the inside and then on the next turn, you're gonna be on the outside. Um, and what you've got here is you've got to accrue Spain have been able to take advantage of the mistake that Hong Kong made. And they've been able to take advantage because they've been behind the crew, being able to turn inside and make a real advantage, which helped them enormously later on in the race. And you can see here Hong Kong, I believe Hong Kong made a mistake and they forgot to turn, which sent Monaco and pushed Monaco wide at that point in the turn. Okay, so let's have a little look at this video. And we've got some other shots in there as well to, to, to have a look at, but let's have a little look as it happens. So you can see the Hong Kong crew clearly made a mistake over shooting that, shooting that turn. The Spanish guys were very much able to take the inside. This is a, late, this is a different um, turn there, so ignore that one. But you can see later on in the race, you could see the Hong Kong and the Monaco crew again starting to struggle and get caught in with each other. I cannot stress how important it is, is to be able to predict mistakes that your um, fellow competitors potentially might make and give yourself options and ways out. There's no point getting caught in collisions um, in endurance. You just lose time. Coastal championships again in Hong Kong. Um, Monaco again are at the in a situation where they get pushed wide by a crew coming round a turn. Okay, so you can see here this crew here is failing to get their turn round. So they're probably very fast on the straight. But they're not as good on that turn. So make sure you do your tactics when you're observing your fellow competitors. You know who are the good turners and who are the turners that are unable to bring their boats round quickly. And you could see here Monaco get pushed wide by the inside crew and Italy to take the advantage um, on this inside. I think they actually go on to win the race. So let's have a little look at that video. It's again, lots of crews on the track. Again, Monaco being pushed wide on that turn. And Italy too just pulling themselves around and going on to, to a great result. Let's have a little look at some more examples um, and we can, I can give you examples. Um, there are so many examples out there, but I'll, I'll give you a few more um, just for you to look at and learn. So this one here is from the World Cup Coastal Championships in Toulon um, in 2018. You see Italy won here doing a real textbook turn. And like any crew, as they come into the turn, as the rudder comes on, the boat will slow, which means the crew behind needs to be aware of that. They cannot simply just plow into the back of the boat that's in front of them. What I really like from Italy, um, Italy 5 here, I think it is, Italy 5 or 6, not quite sure, um, is that Cox pulls up the fin and the crew themselves back off. They use a little bit, they go for a slightly um, tighter turn. They use a bit of a, bit of a shaft break to slow that down. It's a really great example. Um, on here. Beautiful calm day, lots of boys, lots of navigational skill in the course that was laid out by the organising committee here. Okay, Italy 1 comes round that turn and you can see just slowing in Italy 6 just to give them the space that's rightfully theirs, okay, as they come through. Fantastic example of control. And then, of course, the rest of the field arrive. So let's take another look at a turn, okay? So here's a turn which is about navigation. And um, this is some of the most experienced solo rowers we have in the world. It's really interesting that even they have trouble navigating and often because the boats are low, the swell is high, and it's hard to see the hard to see some of the boys, especially if there's a very long leg between one and the other. 
And what's quite interesting, the two lead boats here, okay, two lead boats here, they're clear, they've got a good line, they're coming on to that boy and they're coming round to the boy and then off. But you can see here that the, the solo rower from Spain here, he's made a navigational mistake. And so what he's having to do is to come up and round the boy. And in the video, what I'd like you to do is watch the sculler from Holland who was following the Spanish rower. It's not a great angle, this photograph, but and clearly has to make some very much last minute corrections, very similar to the Spanish um, sculler, um, which shows the difficulty that even the best have. Okay, so you can see lead boats are rounding the turn, but you can see the Spanish sculler absolutely having to come and make quite a lot of corrections to get round that boy. Okay, and you can see again, crews behind him who are following him having to make those corrections again we go you could very nearly getting the wrong side of that boy excellent okay great so even the very best struggle with good accurate steering this is this example here is very similar to the one i was talking at the very outset of the endurance section you could see here this crew that's just riding, surfing down on a bit of a wave here, they again misjudge their navigation into the turning point. A couple of factors that could be due to that, not accounting for the effects of the wind of the waves or the tide, or just the boat being pushed off by surfing down a wave. It's sometimes it's very difficult to control the boats when they're in a surf, or just simply not enough visual looking. If you're only looking over one shoulder, you might mistake one turn for another. So you can see they're coming down, nice swelly conditions, and they're having to do quite a lot of steering to get themselves around that turn, even to the point where they are almost stationary as they come round. So a huge amount of boat speed lost at that time. Oh, goodness, this is the last example I've got for you here. It's an example of passing on the inside. And again, it's all about trying to avoid um, crews and clashes, especially when other crews are making mistakes. So when I show you the video, what I want you to look out for is this crew in blue, as they cut approach, they just don't get a really good turn. Um, and what you find is the white crew, which has taken a slightly wider approach into that turn, means that they're able to take advantage of cut inside the crew. And the one thing I do want to stress in endurance more than anything else, because the boats aren't matched, is that the boats are different shapes and the fins are different sizes and different positions. And so when you hire a boat, it's really, really important to understand how it will turn um, so that you can make good choices um, in how you place and your turns, but also understand how good other boats are at turning. Um, there are some designs that turn sharper than others and you you can often tell that and you can use that in your tactics about how you approach the turns okay so let's have a little look at this last turn here so we've now got the crews coming in approaching into the line you can see the blue the blue boat here really struggled to get a good turn in here and you could see how the crew in the white boat was just able to slip really nicely inside and make up somewhere in the region of a length in that process. In summary for endurance turns, master the approach to the turn. It's so much better to be too wide than too tight and risk being broadside onto the crews as they're coming from behind you. Predict what the crews around you will do and avoid getting boxed in or caught in a clash. Perfect and learn different turning techniques like live airstrokes or shafting and know when to use them. Practice, practice, practice. Know how to slow your boat. Be ready to take advantage of other crew's steering mistakes and research your competitors' turning styles and the turning behaviours of different designs of boats. Well done on completing the keynote. If you like what you heard, tell us in the comments below. If you want to learn more about coastal rowing, the events that are taking place around the world, head over to worldrowing.com. Take care. See you next time.
Thank you.